Welcome to the France 24 debate. I'm Mark Owen. Cuba and the embargo. Imposed back in an era when John F. Kennedy was in the White House and Fidel Castro was the revolutionary leader of Cuba. 60 years later, it's still in place and it weighs on the lives of the people of Cuba. The United Nations this week will vote once again for the 30th time on the lifting of the embargo. And this vote is destined to be blocked once again by the U.S. and its chief ally, Israel. Our panel will be discussing why the U.S. continues to block the lifting of these restrictions, what it means for Cuba, what it means for Latin America. The debate then, uh, the uh, whole issue regarding Cuba and its blockade. Now, since, of course, it was originally put down, there have been many things that have happened. Um, arms sales, of course, were banned four years before uh, the actual full embargo on Cuba. And, of course, that meant that Cuba lent on its major ally, the Soviet Union, uh, to make up that gap. The Cuban Missile Crisis came and went. Hostility and rhetoric continued to boil through. But this thing still remains in an era which is clearly very, very different. So who is holding back from who and who's benefiting? These and other questions will be discussed by our panel here in the studio. Let me introduce them. Anne Kratz is a historian and a specialist in U.S. foreign affairs. And thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. With Anne, Pascal Drouot, expert on Latin America from the Schwozoi Institute. Pascal, as ever, great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. On the other side of our studio is Luis Cabrera, journalist here at France 24, and important to uh, point out here, a Cuban citizen. Luis, great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. We have guests joining us from afar. They are in Cuba, Carlos uh, Alzugaray, who is a Cuban diplomat and uh, former uh, ambassador. Carlos, thank you very much for being with us. And I understand thank we you. have... Thank you for having me. We'll be letting you loose in a second, sir. Eric Svan is joining us too, a member of uh, Republicans in France and author of the book La Bannière Etale. Eric, thank you very much for being with us. We will start with you, sir. Um, can I put a, a basic question to you, Eric Svan, uh, joining us from afar? Republicans in France, but you're in the US, I understand. Uh, Eric, why is the US so dead set against lifting this embargo? Well, the first thing to say is that it's a lot of people um, put uh, confuse an embargo with um, blockade. It is not a blockade. There's no problem for people in Cuba or for the government to buy things from France or Denmark or China or Russia. It's they're only blocking uh, American stuff from being sold there. So the communists in Cuba should be delighted. They should be delighted because they're keeping stuff made by the imperial uh, Yankee capitalist pigs from being brought to Cuba. They should be delighted. Eric, thank you. Let me let me stop. Let me stop you there because I want I wanted a short introduction to what it is, and yeah, I think you've really hit the nail on the head from the Republican perspective. Thank you so very much indeed. Let me bring in Carlos Azulgaray uh, for a reply to that one. Carlos, from your perspective, you you heard what Eric was saying, representing the Republicans uh, abroad, speaking more or less on behalf of the Republican Party. What, what's your point of view, sir? Well, it is uh, maybe maybe the blockade is too uh, is too excessive, maybe. I don't know, but an embargo is not because, uh, and, the, and this every government in the world agrees, is that the U.S. coercive measures against Cuba or sanctions against Cuba, to use two words that are not blockade, uh, are extraterritorial. They, they really stop other countries from trading with Cuba. For example, no country can export to Cuba products more, with more than 10% American components, or can they import anything with more than 10% Cuban components? So if you want to buy a candy in the United States for, uh, from a third country, you have to make sure that less than 10% Cuban is in that candy. Or if you want to buy a car, the car has to have less than 10% of nickel, which makes it very complicated. On the other hand, there are the financial measures that make it very difficult to do transactions through banks. Banks have been fined for doing transactions <clears throat> as simple as transferring some money to Cuba or receiving some dollars from Cuba. So it is a conjunction of unilateral coercive measure of extraterritorial nature. And the most important thing is that since 1960, the U.S. in an internal memo said the purpose is to bring about hunger, desperation, and the overthrow of the Cuban government. 
Now, another thing that has to be taken into account is that putting Cuba in the list of states that sponsor terrorism without any justification at all adds additional sanctions to Cuba. And finally, the U.S. Um, has uh, closed down the consular section in, of their embassy in Havana, which makes it even more difficult. So it, it is a very hostile policy. It's cruel. The, the, embargo, the embargo, or blockade, as you want to call it, has been increased during the pandemia, at moments when Cuba was struggling to produce vaccines for its population. The United States, the, the Trump administration, and later the Biden administration, increased the number of sanctions. So it is, it is a cruel and perverse policy to create a situation in which the Cuban people rise against their government and overthrow it. Carlos, thank you for now very much indeed. Yeah. Just picking up what you were saying there about the, the recent uh, demonstrations, the U.S. imposing sanctions on Cuban police force uh, leaders and, uh, and others in response to those uh, crackdowns on protesters that you were talking about there. Uh, Biden promising Cuban-American leaders that more action is coming. We'll get a sense there's a Democrat-Republican kind of face-off going on uh, within U.S., which is possibly leaving Cuba as the kind of uh, scapegoat in many ways. Those demonstrations we were talking about, July the 11th, 2021, uh, spontaneous street protests in 50 cities saw thousands of people uh, clamoring for change. They were shouting freedom, down with the dictatorship, we are hungry. All this kind of a, and a mass kind of roll-up of problems are often coming from the, the pandemic as well, as uh, Carlos was saying. Let's bring in more guests here in the studio, Anne Kratz. Um, is Cuba a victim of a kind of difference of opinion here between the Democrats on one hand, Obama when he came to power? basically relax things a bit more, then Trump comes back in and closes the door again. Right. Well, when we, when we, when Obama started lifting uh, many of the sanctions imposed on Cuba, it immediately had a positive effect on Cuba. I think we can say this without uh, fear of being contradicted. Uh, businesses were allowed to open up, uh, to be owned by Cubans themselves. Uh, businesses that had American owners could actually be set up in Cuba and so on and so forth. That's really just from the point of view of, of, uh, of uh, business, the, the business approach. Um, and Obama was obviously uh, convinced that that very long, the longest of all embargoes that were ever uh, imposed on another country by the United States or by any other country for that matter, uh, had not produced the results that we were all hoping it would initially and the result that we were hoping it would would be that there would be that there would be a change of regime and that the communist marxist regime of cuba would fall apart etc well it didn't but at the same time when obama did relax measures including for american citizens to go and travel to cuba um, it brought all kinds of well-being measures uh, in cuba itself and then comes trump and he starts you know, uh, going back to what I might call the body politic in the United States, sometimes whether they be Democrat or Republicans, and that is called an addiction to sanctions. Once you have sanctions in place, nobody seems to know how to lift them, even when they don't obviously fulfill the, uh, the original aim. And what's happening to Cuba now is um, uh, disastrous, basically. But... I might add, if I may, mm, you may there, is a, there is, of course, the other political element. The political element is the Hispanic vote, mm. and especially the Cuban-American uh, vote, especially in states like Florida and Texas. Now, what do we see? We have a senator in Florida that, whose name is Marco Rubio, himself of Cuban descent, and we have Ted Cruz in Texas. And those two uh, guys, I was going to say, forgive my... Uh, <laughs> and you can say guys, don't you worry about so it. You, your English is fantastic. Never, Please continue. Yeah, are never going to let the embargo against Cuba lapse, and certainly not now, in the, just before the midterm elections. And the problem is that since Obama, during the Obama period, there was obviously a sentiment shared by many Americans that people, things should open up, right? Obama was an opening up kind of person, and he was followed by the population. But a lot of things have changed since then, and it, it's only been, what, eight years ago, but it, most, it feels like 20 years ago. And even the young Cuban Americans who were all on the side of Obama when he ran for president, some of them have turned around, and definitely the older uh, Cuban Americans are very much against lifting the embargo for really one reason, and that is 
because they cannot be assured that if the embargo were lifted, they would ever recover the money that the Marxist government uh, took away from them when they had old, to go into exile. Old wounds old still wounds open, still, still hurting. And thank you. Let's bring in uh, a, a Cuban youngster. Um, forgive me calling you youngster. I'm not being patronising, <laughs> but you are a lot younger than me. Thank you, um, Luis, um, give us a, a sense <laughs> of, of life that you left behind in Cuba when you came to France. What is life like there? What is life, life not like, like there now for your family, for instance? Yeah, I just went to Cuba back in July, so I have uh, fresh memories of how uh, people are being affected about the situation nowadays. Of course, it's a combination of factors. It's not only the US embargo, you have the COVID pandemic, and you have the own Cuban government whose economic uh, policy is a disaster as well. But let's, um, I propose to show you some of the examples of the main issues the Cuban Cuban people encounter nowadays. And let's try to make a link of um, how it's, uh, that the responsibility, the responsibility for those problems belongs or not to the embargo correspond or not to the um, US sanctions. Um, for example, one of the main issues they have, Cubans nowadays, is food. Um, probably Dr. Sugaray can speak more about that later, but um, in the case of food, uh, you have a shortage because, of course, the economic situation is so bad. But also, when uh, Cuban um, companies try to import food to the country, then comes the persecution of the um, Office of Foreign Asset Controls of the United States, saying like, hey, you cannot go to Cuba anymore with this, I don't know, let's, let us say, soybeans, because if you do so, you're going to be punished. Then if the Cuban agriculture sector, it doesn't matter if it's a private uh, producer or if, it, if it is a government, if they try to buy something in the, in the international market, they will get the refusal, as um, we were, uh, Professor Zagara was pointing before. For example, <coughs> the um, um, latest figures is, is that in the last year, they made 518 requests for um, tractors, batteries, engines, forklifts, parts and pieces for, the, for agriculture, and only nine of those 518 were accepted. And we are not talking about the US, we're talking about the entire world. So is all that because of the US embargo? Well, is, is, is that, is, does that set the precedent that creates the situation then? We are talking about food in this case. Mm. Of course, you have that on one hand, and on the other hand, you have, of course, a lot of regulations that the Cuban government imposes on private agricultures. And, of course, that is, us, that, that is also another reason why the uh, food situation is so bad in Cuba. But you need to know that you have both of those reasons. So the Luis, U.S. embargo is not making it better. It's actually worsening the situation. Luis, thank you very much indeed. I know Eric wants to get in from the Republicans, but before I come to you, Eric, I need to bring in Pascal Druo here in the studio. Pascal, uh, expert on Latin America from the Choiseul Institute. Um, your view on, on this uh, embargo, I mean, should it be lifted? Why is it being blocked? The UN has voted 30 times on it. It gets blocked every time. What should happen? I think that... In terms of international yeah. justice, in terms of what's right. Sure. Uh, I, I think that the embargo became, through the decades, part of both identity and both national identity for the USA, for Cuba. And it is a source of legitimacy of the power for, for Cuba and, of course, for the uh, political measures in, in the USA. Uh, it is part of a political myth uh, political uh, obligation, duty for Latin America to engage some countries behind Cuba or supporting the US position. And today we are in a Kafka situation, in fact, because if the embargo is at the source since the executive order of JFK in 62, it is today uh, a wakenet the demons of the nuclear war and the international situation today, the tension uh, are reinforcing this feeling and of course it is becoming worse for, for the myth of, uh, of uh, the Cuban today, Cuban risk. So as Luis was saying, it is very hard for the food, but I've seen during many years in the energy sector in Cuba, how hard it is. And for sure, uh, uh, how the embargo is uh, uh, managed to limit the, uh, the maintenance, the, uh, the developing of uh, uh, the uh, uh, electric plants in Cuba. So the situation today, it is 
the embargo is one part of the problem. The problem is global, is political, is economical, is social. That's part of uh, uh, institutional uh, in Cuba, but that's part of the identity in Latin America. And today we are in the Kafka situation. Kafka as situation, certainly. This is obviously is a story with a lot of history. Uh, Batista was the previous leader of uh, Cuba before Fidel Castro uh, took over. Batista was a, an American-backed dictator, I think it's fair to say. Uh, he, of course, overthrown in 1959 by uh, Castro's coup. Castro would then be a thorn in the side of Washington for decades to come. An arms embargo against the now Communist Cuba came soon after that revolution. Kennedy it was, the Democratic president of the US, who oversaw the imposing of the trade embargo in February 1962. Let's get back to Eric Svan, member of Republicans in France, who's joining us from the United States. Eric, we appreciate your time uh, you're taking to speak to us. I cut you short at the beginning. I apologize for that. You've now got free reign. Tell us what you think about the situation. Can I just put it to you that this has become, in many ways, a kind of a kind of hobby horse for the Republicans because they've got so many people to play to who want this to remain, so they're keeping it as a policy which perhaps no longer makes sense. Would you agree with that? Well, I would say that uh, Ann Kretz mentioned the uh, Cuban Republicans, uh, the Cuban Americans, especially Indeed. Marco Rubio and, uh, and um, um, Ted Cruz, Cruz, Ted Cruz. And she said, um, the, the, uh, the, these, she suggested that these, P, these Cuban Americans are excessive because they won't forgive the Cubans for taking their money from them. They didn't take their money from them. They stole it from them. Of course, they don't want to uh, be nice, want to play nice and all that. But the main question I have here is which country is the, the one that delivers most um, food foodstuffs to Cuba? And it is Los Estados Unidos de Norte America. It's the USA because the embargo has uh, exceptions for humanitarianism. And that includes food and it includes uh, medicine. Those are two things that uh, are never mentioned. And uh, they never mentioned either. I mean, Russia su supported or the Soviet Union was supported Cuba for uh, 40 years, uh, 30, 40 years. And it, it still doesn't explain why Cuba can't live without the Yankee imperialist capitalist pigs and simply rely on France, on Canada, on Mexico, on Venezuela, which they, they do, can't. unfortunately. <laughs> and um, I would end with this. Um, there's a um, uh, Gustavo Arcos Bernes was, uh, was, uh, was uh, one of the fighters with Castro. And when he was under this American dictator, as you called uh, Batista, they were put into jail. They were put into jail for 15 years, and their jail consisted of a hospital ward. They were put in a nice hospital ward where they could cook their own food, and where um, and they were they were let out after less than two years. When when Castro is 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 uh, when when he became president, Bernes uh, did not agree with what he what he said, and Bernes was put into a real prison where the the, the roof was so low that you couldn't stand up straight and he was there for 28 years and he wrote about this in the new york times so there is so to simply go over the the communist revolutions like we do with mccarthyism you know when mccarthy was in power that was who was in power in russia in the kremlin it was stalin i don't think stalin is uh has anything to do with paranoia i think being paranoia paranoid about stalin or the Castro brothers uh, has a little is pr pretty reasonable. And Erica, I, need, I need to now cut you off because I need to bring yes. someone else into comment here. But thank you for Go making ahead. your points, and I'm, I'm giving, trying to give you as fair a shout as I can. Thank you so very much thank indeed. You. you mentioned many things there. Eric Spann mentioned many things there. Luis, I know when he talked about medicine. Yes, you, I just want to. You flinched. Tell us what. Yeah, why. I just want to bring a perspective because it is easy to say that the, that the U.S. is the fourth partner of U.S. imports, but uh, yeah, because like if. Cuba wants to buy something from France, and it, it, it does not meet the criteria of having less than 10% of parts made in the US, France cannot sell it to Cuba, and Cuba cannot buy it from France, or China, or any other country in the world. So this actually so, creates parameters that so, basically make things difficult. Yeah, so of course Cuba can buy food from the, from, the, from, the, from the United States because it's so close, and because it is the only country allowing itself to sell products to Cuba. And in the case of medicine, this is something that is probably the most shocking uh, aspect of the U.S. embargo, because we're talking about human lives here. And um, there are a lot of restrictions. And, and I have the most recent example, for, um, uh, this year happened, for example, the U.S. 
prevents Cuba from acquiring custodial. This is a chemical solution that is used to maintain the viability of the organ to be transplanted. There were eight kids in Cuba who needed this for months and they couldn't buy it in the United States because the United States wouldn't allow it to. And they couldn't buy it anywhere else because the rest of the world was afraid of having uh, sanctions from the US. And the solution to this was Cuban Americans in the US gathering money to buy it uh, in the United States and trying to bring it to Cuba. They needed a license to save these eight Cuban uh, children lives. It's something crazy. And let me tell you something, this is something that is very close to me because I know some of these children who didn't make it. So we are talking about Cuban lives here, children's lives. And uh, this needs to stop. Luis, thank you very much indeed. Let's go back to Cuba. Carlos uh, Alzugaray, the Cuban diplomat and former ambassador, is uh, listening in. Uh, Carlos, I, I know you've probably got many things to say uh, about uh, what you've been hearing. Ah, yes, yes. Go, go ahead. I'll, I'll just give you carte blanche. Away you go. Go ahead. No, let me, let me answer part of what some of the people have said. For example, uh, Batista killed, well, there are different, different, different calculations of people say, 20,000 Cubans, some other people say 6,000 Cubans. But let me tell you, for example, the uh, part of the people who attacked the Moncada barracks in 53 were taken prisoner and murdered. They were murdered, simply. My father's friend, a senator, was murdered and his body thrown into El Laguito. So and that was under in Batista. Batista time, in Batista's time, uh, they were murdered. Simply, tortured, simply. Um, and the revolution in Cuba happened because it had to happen. It was inevitable because Batista in 1952 took power through a coup d'etat and stopped the uh, democratic process. So the democratic process in Cuba stopped back in 1952. And a new democracy was created by the Cuban government. But let us, let us not discuss that. The question of the embargo, the, the, Cuba buys a lot of foodstuff from many sources. For example, the wheat that is bought for baking bread is not bought from the United States. It's bought from Ukraine, from Russia, from whatever, from Canada. Uh, the little foodstuff that Cuba can buy from the United States has to pay, be paid in advance, in cash, through European banks. And Cuba must assume the the exchange the 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 exchange um, um, taxes that when you change when you change euros to dollar to pay dollar you have to pay for that so the, but let's be very frank in 1960 an American Secretary of State a deputy of the Secretary of State said we must to put sanctions in place to bring about hunger desperation and the overthrow of the Cuban government that's the policy of of the United States towards Cuba. To that must be added the, the millions of dollars that are being given to uh, people in Miami, where there is a cottage industry of creating situations in Cuba and reproducing fake news and creating situations so that there be that famous uprising that they have been waiting for and never happened. Uh, so let me say this. Uh, the, the policy, the policy that the United States has now on Cuba is a Cold War policy. It's a Cold War that looks for uh, an absolute surrender of the Cuban government by a, a combination of coercive measures to make life difficult for Cubans and the creation of an atmosphere in the social networks that make it difficult. Now, what this produces in Cuba is a very negative political effect. One, you give the government the perfect alibi to say, well, it's not me, my, it's not my policies that are wrong, which I disagree. I think their policies are wrong and they should change it. But the embargo gives them the chance to blame someone else. And secondly, by by this uh, policy of, of, of putting pressure on the Cuban government, putting pressure on the Cuban people, it... Uh, it, it produces an escalation of tensions in Cuba, which makes Cuba believe that we are under siege and that when you are under siege, you react very strongly. Now, Obama in, 19, in 2014 changed that, basically because that policy was a failure. And that policy is going to be a failure. Let's face it. 
the United States is not going to make a uh, result on a policy of sanctions to Cuba. The best way to go is a normalization process in which Cuba is uh, not under so much pressure, not under so much tension, so that we can work out our problems. We can work out our, our human rights problem, our problems that have to do with the economy, but not in a country that is under siege. We are a country under siege. We feel under siege. And everything that you have to do or you want to do, it's, 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 there is always the U.S. Uh, blockade or sanctions in the middle. I remember in 2015, Cuba and the United States agreed to, to cooperate on the, on the issue of Ebola in Africa. The Cuban medical mission was supposed to be paid through the WHO, the World Health Organization. Well, you know what happened? When the Health, World Health Organization sent to uh, Sierra Leone the money to pay the Cuban doctors who were risking their lives, the money was stopped in New York. Any <laughs> transaction with Cuba that involves dollars has to go through a clearing house in New York that takes about three or four months to approve it. So the result was that Cuba had to send the, the doctors it had sent to Africa under that agreement, which was uh, agreed with the American side, because the U.S. stopped those dollars that, that needed to, to be paid, the Cuban doctors that were risking their lives to, uh, to finish the Ebola epidemic in Africa. This is the kind of relationship we have we have with the United States is, is a cruel and perverse policy that only produces pain and doesn't achieve Carlos, the thank you. purpose that, that, that they want. Carlos Alzugaray, thank you very much indeed. Eric Svan, coming to you in a minute. Pascal Duro. Yes, I think that uh, today the symbolism of uh, uh, the war, the symbolism of the uh, 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 nuclear crisis in 62 became in fact <clears throat> the rule, when the world has changed and nothing changed with Cuba. And that's very impressive to, to, to have this, uh, this feeling and this feeling now when we have in Europe a conventional war, when we have this risk of uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, deterrence, when the real risk today is in the China Sea, uh, is between the uh, Koreas. Uh, that's the point. So that's very impressive to see the up and down of this relation that's not between Democrats or Republicans. Elms Burton has been taken through the uh, Clinton administration. Uh, Torricelli uh, through uh, Bush 41. I mean, that's source of identity, and I'm very, very worrying, in fact, today. Pascal, Anne, go ahead. Well, I think the irony, the historical irony here is that the, the embargo was imposed on Cuba because they had the goal to remove a Batista who had been installed by the United States. So there's a, there's a, there's a cruel, as your former interlocutor said, the irony there. But I think one should concentrate on what's going to happen next. Um, at this point, the Biden administration isn't going to change a thing to the embargo for several reasons, some of which I've outlined because of the competition, in rhetoric anyway, from the Cuban-American uh, senators. But it's also, I think, and, and one perhaps should mention this, it's also because the whole image of Cuba has considerably changed in the world. Cuba had an aura, okay? Uh, Castro had an aura, and a lot of French people... Uh, as we know, sort of related to that aura. And there was also the figure of Che Guevara. And both of those figures have now, as it were, passed into the, into the background for young people, including for young uh, Hispanics in the United States. And so those young Hispanics in the United States who had a sort of uh, identity uh, relation to those two uh, heroes, if you will, of, of, of Latin America, namely Castro, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, those figures don't, are, are not important anymore and, and they are turning away from Cuba. Cuba doesn't interest the Hispanics in the United States as much as it used to. And this is why, in a sense, uh, because Biden is, and the Democrats want, and legitimately so, want to get hold of the Hispanic uh, vote, uh, 
because they've done more for the Hispanics, certainly, than the Republicans. Um, and this is why Biden is not going to do anything about this now. So, unfortunately, we feel that this embargo, which is the oldest one in the world and which has, we have the proof that it didn't produce the results that we wanted. And we also have the proof that when Obama, I repeat myself, but I think it's important to underline it, when Obama tried to lighten it anyway, if not taking, take, it out, take it out altogether, there was, there was immediate response in Cuba itself, and it was good for the Cuban people. As soon as Trump made it, you know, very tough again, immediately the Cuban government, going back to its old ways, I must say, of, you know, uh, oppressing and repressing, uh, immediately went into that kind of a gear, and, and Cuba is the worst is the worst for it today. And thank you very much indeed. Let's talk a little bit briefly before we come back to our guests about uh, help that the U.S. Uh, has given uh, to Cuba. Uh, humanitarian aid, Hurricane Ian striking Cuba in September, causing extensive damage uh, to the island. Uh, this is all on record, so there's nothing new coming out here. Uh, the U.S. announced then $2 billion in aid to help the Cuban people. Um, that's got to be generous by anybody's uh, estimation. Let's say here now from Cuba's foreign minister, uh, speaking sometime later about the cost of the embargo to Cuba. Vimos ayer el anuncio de el ofrecimiento... Yesterday, the U.S. government announced their offer of $2 million through the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, for which we have also expressed our gratitude. I cannot yet give figures on the losses caused by Hurricane Ian. Still, I did give data on the damages caused by the embargo on Cuba over the last 17 months, because the embargo is a permanent pandemic, it is a constant hurricane. Correction, before we go any further, it was two million, not two billion. The minute I said billion, everyone said, no, it was millions, so there you go. But nonetheless, it is a substantial amount of money. Eric Svan from the Republicans in France movement, author of La Bannière et Allée. Eric is in the US, but he represents the Republicans here in France. He'll be back here soon. And when you are, Eric, come into the studio because you're welcome anytime. Um, Thanks, too. You are, how can I put it? I mean, completely at odds with everybody around the table, I think, about the situation. Many people, uh, yeah, many people, wherever they're watching, might be thinking, why does this continue? Isn't it, isn't it up to the US to play the more large role, the more generous role, and say, OK, let's, 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 let, let's sign this off to the past and let's open things up more so everybody can benefit? Well, I, I want to, yeah, I agree with, with some of what Ann Kret said. And I think that nobody ever mentions the name of Cuba's president. And I don't think most people in France or most people in the USA or anyway know that his name is Miguel Diaz-Canel. Nobody knows that. Everybody is always talking about the Castros. But beyond that, um, you're talking about, uh, you, uh, the ambassador mentioned a lot of people who were killed by, um, by Batista. He doesn't mention the, the number of people who were killed by... Uh, che Guevara and the Castros, and um, people are. Let me to give the put, to put this in perspective. Think of Pinochet. Everybody was against Pinochet. Over I don't know, 15, 20 years, Pinochet killed 3,000 people. Um, Fidel Castro killed 20,000. Um, more people, more Cubans escaped from Cuba than people escaped from Chile, and Chile is part of the Latin America, the South American continent. Eric, I, I, I hear what you're Cuba saying. Is an I, I, sorry to sorry to cut across you because I, you, you're interesting and you're making good points. But I hear what you're saying. But bring it up to date to today. Why continue the embargo? I would say that, like she said, like Anne Kratz said, most people I don't know. Lots of Latin Americans do not want it. But uh, they they're also uh, wary of all the of all the people both in Europe and in the USA who want to say oh let bygones be bygones when they, they have when the Castro brothers have killed so many people and stolen so much and forced people to emigrate you know often without their 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 goods. The, the, so um, if we, Eric, the, uh, the, so the, the treaty signed in ninety six. I'm going back to my research here. Helms Burton Treaty. It said that once the Castros are gone, the the embargo will go. Uh, clearly, that's not been respected by the United States. We had a guest here in the studio, Louis, talking about getting organs to children who needed to be saved, and that was slowed down by the embargo. It doesn't make any sense, does it anymore? Surely. I, I, I think I think that you have you get the you get these sh sh small stories that are the tragic. Oh they're tragedies. Eric, it's, life, Eric, it's someone's life. Eric, it's someone's life. Someone's life, Eric. People that were killed 
by, by the Castro brothers. Eric, the it's, of Cubans. It, but that's the past. And you know? at some point, the past that's, has to be put to put away, and, doesn't it? We well, can learn to, from the past. Have, like in South Africa, you it's, need to get a, a truth committee that puts everything Truth and Reconciliation Committee. As, as and the, the, the communists never do that. Ah, okay. Right now, there are, pe there are people who, who talk about we need communism. You know, in American high schools and in European high schools, we need uh, communism in our countries because they're never taught about the number of people that, that were killed. Jeez. For example, people... Um, um, one last thing. Eric, people, Eric, one Eric, last thing. Most people last thing, that, quick, that, go on. Yeah, most Can people I say, say something? That it was Hang a on, good Carlos. Thing that the, I'm sorry, what? No, no, Eric, finish your sentence, then it's Carlos next. Okay. I, most I people say, say it's a good thing that the Tsar of Russia was overturned by the communists, but during the Tsar of Russia, you had 200 people who were killed per year by the Tsarist regime. And that came to 1,500 people who died of starvation every day in the communist gulags of Lenin and Stalin. So people are not being taught their, their, their history. No system is ideal, Eric. I think we all agree with that one. However, I think Eric, some of the things you're saying about keeping, Eric, up, this, keeping up this embargo uh, in spite of uh, the fact that, say, you know, the children that Luis was talking about you know, would, be, would risk dying, I think I find that quite chilling. Carlos, you're on in Cuba. Eric, Eric is, is making propaganda. Let me give you an example. The, the invaders of the Bay of Pigs, 1,200 of them, 1,200 of them were made prisoner. Were they killed? No, they were returned to the United States in less than a year. So this bloody uh, dictatorship Let's go, the people who attacked them with weapons who were sent by the CIA. And that's a fact. So please, mention facts, not propaganda. History is made about facts, not propaganda. That's the only thing that's I want to add about what Belgium. Eric is saying. The, 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 the Cuban revolution was inevitable. The conditions in Cuba made it inevitable. A revolution is not a dinner party. It's, revolutions are, by their very nature, violent. I think one of the less violent revolutions in the, the history of the world was the Cuban Revolution. Uh, After historian Hugh years, Thomas, why who, has there more that, who has written in Cuba, historian historian Hugh Thomas, who has written this book about Cuba called a History of Freedom, he he has calculated that in the first couple of years, only 600 or 700 people were executed. War criminals, by the way, people who had tortured and murdered Cubans. So there is no history in Cuba like the one of Pinochet. I lived in Argentina for four years during the military dictatorship. That was really terror. More than 70,000 people were killed by the Argentinian military dictatorship. No, there's no fact, no, no, no concrete fact that demonstrates that something like that has ever happened in Cuba after 1959. Carlos, thank you. Luis Carrera here in the studio. Yeah, I was, I was uh, listening to Eric as well, and I, I wanted to remind that the CIA um, has uh, executed plans in Cuba that ha has actually killed people. If we remember in, in the 1980s, uh, 1987, I think, there was a um, plane who was uh, attacked like in the air, there was, there was a bomb inside the plane who killed all of them. 1976. 1976. 1976. Voila. Thank you, doctor. And uh, this is uh, like we are, we're talking about the U.S. government funding this kind of terror attacks, not to mention the one happening in Cuban soil, because they, they also send people uh, with uh, large guns and shooting out to the hotels. And I wanted to, I wanted to bring as well an element that I think is, is very important, Mark, is because if you think about the embargo very, like with, with, a, with a cold mind, right? Mm. This is obviously not convenient for Cuba, like Cuban people are suffering. It's not convenient for the Cuban government because we're seeing nowadays that Cubans are going to the streets and protesting because the situation is so hard. Um, Pascal was mentioning the situation with the, with, the, with, the, with the electricity. Cuba cannot buy parts for its uh, thermoelectric power plants in France or in Germany, nor in the United States. If they're bringing fuel um, from abroad, the ships are, uh, are stopped and they cannot uh, go to Cuba. So um, it is not convenient for Cuba, right? It is not convenient for the U.S. either. 
because they're spending so much taxpayers' money on something that is not working. It's not so, working. So this, and then keeping keeping this embargo going, Luis, it's it's an ideological thing, isn't it? John Bolton calling, uh, well, influencing Donald Trump back in when well, he was elected in 2016. Of course, Bolton calling Cuba part of a troika of tyranny, Pascal, uh, with Nicaragua and Venezuela, which resulted in Trump really imposing all the sanctions on Cuba all over again. It's an ideological thing, as we see more countries going towards the left uh, yes. across the continent uh, of America. Yeah. Is Washington basically worried about what is happening, what the trends are, and therefore wants to keep the status quo for whatever yeah. reason, which makes no sense to anybody else who's looking at it around the table, apart from Eric? Yes, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> uh, possible, but uh, for, uh, uh, you are right, Latin America is changing, mm. and that's very important for the USA. Uh, the biggest economy in Latin America are now uh, under left uh, power. Brazil, since uh, 24 hours, uh, Mexico, Colombia, uh, Chile, Argentina, I mean, the top five in Latin America now is under left powers. So, uh, uh, and we could see the effect in the last uh, assembly of the uh, American states uh, organization where it is a strong debate and where we can see that in Latin America, Cuba is not alone. Cuba is a country introduced in the international scene, uh, uh, very strong in Latin America. So take care on that. Uh, in some countries as Brazil, the first partner economic of the first Latin America economy, Brazil, is China. They are not the USA. So take care also with the, with the, US, uh, the USA to, to, to stay under this historical, I, I can understand, but historical symbolism. The reality today has changed. Can we imagine in 2022 that with Germany, France wouldn't speaking, uh, speak with Germany? Because in 44, yeah. Yeah. in 44, no one in France or no one in Germany wanted to speak together. Today we are more than partner. We are very strong in Europe. Pascal, thank you very much indeed. Everyone wants to speak, but sadly time is up. I'll just leave you with one thought. A very wise Muslim one once told me, in change there is blessing. So maybe in some kind of change there will be blessings for all of us. Thanks to all the panel for taking part. Eric Svan from Republicans in France, joining us from the US. Carlos Alzugaray uh, in Cuba. Thank you so very much indeed. Luis Guerrero here in the thank studio. You. Thank you, Luis. Thanks to Pascal Giroux from the Choiseul Institute and Anne Kratz. Thank you for joining us too, very much indeed. Thank you for watching wherever you are. Stay with us. More to come here on France 24.